Acts chapter 27. The Apostle Paul is on his way to Rome. He's going to Rome because he's appealed to Caesar, his right as a Roman citizen. On the ship that he's taking him there, there's a cargo, there's a captain, there are sailors. But there's also a soldier, a centurion, back other soldiers under him, and they have a bunch of prisoners. They're on their way in an arduous and difficult journey. And the Bible says in verse 9 that when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, the date on the calendar after which it was deemed unsafe to take that voyage. Paul admonished them and said to them, Sir, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt and it will hurt and much damage, not only to the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Because the haven was not commodious to enter in, the more part advised to depart thence also. If by any means they might attain the Venus and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete and lies toward the southwest and northwest, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had attained their purpose. Loosing thence, they sailed to a close by creek. But not long after, there rose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the, wind, the ship was caught up and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive, and turning under a certain island, which was called Claude, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used help undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, and so were driven, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest. The next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. And after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete and have gained this harm and loss. So, ladies, there is biblical precedent for saying, I told you so. But please note those words preceding Paul's statement that says, After long abstinence. And now, I exhort you to be in good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. I love that. Would you say that with me? God, whose I am and whom I serve. Let's say it together. God, whose I am and whom I serve. Hey, do you belong to God? In Asia. But every man who has ever lived has been sinful by birth and by behavior. And though God loves you, He wants to spend forever with you. Think about that. We, we have grandchildren. Some of you come to the house a couple of days after I get back. And we're excited to see them. We have a big time. We live in 10 acres. We're taking for rides out in the woods on the ranger. You know, I wrestle on the floor with them. We play all kinds of games. And we love every minute of it. And when they leave, we go, ah. God wants you forever. There's one thing that separates you from God, keeps you from spending eternity living in heaven, and that's sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. If I had to pay the penalty that I owe for my sin, I'd have to die and spend eternity in hell, and so would you. But God loves you so much that He made a way to take care of your sin. Now, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, so you can't pay for it by joining a church, being good, giving away money, getting baptized. The Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The Lord Jesus Christ always has been God, but He came to this earth, was born of a virgin, became man, all God, all man at the same time, never sinned, and went to the cross and bled and died. And the Bible says, Christ died for us. He says, Christ died for our sin, and He took in His body all the sins of all the world, and the penalty for your sin has already been paid. The question you have to face is not what do I do about my sin, it's what do you do about God's Son? Because the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And I want you to know, no matter why you came here or how you came here, you can walk out knowing that all your sins have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That you never have to answer for any of the bad things you've ever done, but the moment you die, you go straight to heaven to be with God forever. And then you can say, God, whose I am and whom I serve. It stood by me the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given thee all them that sail with thee. Hey, be careful who you get in the boat with. How be it? We must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we're driven up and down in Asia about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they sounded again about 15 fathoms. And fearing lest we should fall upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and whisked for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they let down the boat, this would be the light boat, the uh, smaller boat on the big ship, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the ship. Paul said to the centurions of his soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the rope to the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming, Paul besought them all to take me. Saying, This is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Where is my prayer to take some meat? For this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. Obviously, I was not on that boat. Then, the Bible says, when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. When he broke it, he began to eat. This is not a Thanksgiving message, but it is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I call to your attention the fact that in the midst of a terrible storm where no daylight, not even stars, had been seen for 14 days, and the ship was in such desperate, desperate straits, they were throwing off not only the cargo, but the pack thing, the things they used to control the ship. Paul gave thanks. Well, the wind was whipping and the boat was bouncing up and down in the waves and the thunder was crashing and the lightning was splitting the darkened sky. Paul gave thanks. In everything, give thanks. Not for everything, but in everything. Then, verse 36, were they all of good cheer. They also took some meat now. It is popular these days to denigrate the value of the spoken word. We're going to have to have uh, real short sermons because people have short attention spans and we'll have to have a lot of video stuff to go along with it or they won't be able to get it. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words. Did you know God knew all about videos when He said, that he wanted his gospel to be communicated by preaching. So give me a thousand words. I'll give you the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, a sonnet by Shakespeare, the Hippocratic Oath, I'll know it without the Gettysburg Address, and I'll have enough left over for most of the Boy Scout Oath. You tell me any picture worth those thousand words. The words of Paul, not the stopping of the storm, but the speaking of truth from the man of God. And all 276 people cheered up by his words. The words you speak are very important, and the words you let yourself hear are very important. Verse 37, we were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 so When they eaten enough, God just always do that well easy too much. They lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but discovered a certain creek of the shore into which they were minded it were possible to thrust in the ship. When they taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail of the wind and made towards shore, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship 
a ground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners with some of them to swim out and escape. But it's been 30. Willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose. And commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on board and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. I'll talk to you this morning about this thought, how to wreck your ship and survive your wreck. Lord, would you guide me by your Spirit to say the things that would be the most help to the most people. And most of all, that would please you. I pray that you would bind Satan and those fallen angels that serve him and keep them from snatching the seed of your word out of the soil of our hearts as you told us they'd love to do. I pray that we would be going to be good ground open gladly receiving what you have. And I pray that those who don't know they have a home in heaven would not leave this room until they do. And I pray that your children would be drawn close to you and that anything you tell us to do, we'd obediently do in Jesus' name. Amen. How to wreck your ship. Number one, listen to the wrong counsel. The Apostle Paul is an experienced traveler. And he says we're going to have real trouble if we keep this voyage up. Our lives potentially, the ship as well. Now, the centurion liked Paul. He'd given him liberty to visit some friends. He was very courteous to him. He didn't want to lose Paul's life. Later on, the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners. Because if you're a Roman soldier in charge of a prisoner, you can bring back a dead body, and that's okay, but you can't bring back nobody. You bring back nobody, they'll kill your body. So they quite reasonably said, we're going to kill these prisoners. They might escape. And the centurion said, no, I don't want to lose Paul, so I won't let you do that. Well, in spite of Paul's counsel, though he respected him and admired him, he believed the owner and the master of the ship more than those things spoken by Paul. You're going to have to decide in life many times, sometimes several times in a short period of time, who you believe more. Now, I'm an experienced traveler. I've flown over two million miles just on Delta Airlines. And that's why whenever there's an issue, they ask you what to do. Mr. So Lett, should we go fly this airborne plane or wait till we fix the part? So, you think the went? No, they never asked me. They asked the weatherman and the pilot and the mechanic. But the Apostle Paul was not speaking as an experienced traveler. He was speaking as a man of God. And he gave them instruction from God. You are blessed to be in a church where you have a man of God. And he opens up the Word of God. And he tells you what the Word of God says and how it applies to your life. And if you have any sense, you listen to him. You have some rascal out there on the radio or the television or on social media. You want to wreck your ship? Listen to the wrong counsel. Number two, you want to wreck your ship? Go along with the crowd. The more part thought it was a good idea to go ahead and get out of there now before the weather got even worse and uh, they wanted to find a better place to stay. Did you know independent fundamental Baptists are not in the majority? Did you know God's people have never been in the majority? But did you know it doesn't make a lick of difference? Bob Jones Sr. used to say, you and God make a majority in any situation. The fact of the matter is that the majority is almost always wrong. Go along with the crowd. Do it everybody else does. Uh, cancel Sunday night church because some church down the road does it. Bring in rock and roll music because they think it helps you get some people in. Don't teach your children the Word of God. Uh, do some parent effectiveness training and you never tell them they did anything wrong. And everything's okay. You just redirect them. Oh, that's lovely, that picture you colored on the wall. Why don't we try coloring one on this paper here? Parents who never tell their children that they are at fault for anything should not be surprised to have them grow up to feel that they're not responsible for anything. All right, the ship, 
Let's do the wrong counsel. Number two, go along with the crowd. Number three, do what's convenient. Because the haven was not commodious to winter in. Come on, Paul! There's no Holiday Inn Express nice place like your pastor has put me in. There's not even a motel set. Let alone not have a chick fil We don't even have McDonald's or a Burger King. It's not convenient. We live in a society that is driven by comfort and convenience. And so if God forbid that you'd have to give up your Sunday afternoon to put the gospel in the packet to help 25,000 people potentially know about Jesus. So God forbid that you'd have to come to a service on a Sunday night or come back on a midweek service or attend every night of a revival meeting or get up early to read your Bible. No, if you want to wreck your ship, do what's convenient. Wreck your ship, listen to the wrong gospel, go along with the crowd, do it's convenient. But now they're in a storm. They're going to have a shipwreck. But Paul says you can all survive. All 276. So how do you survive your wreck and give you four things? I want you to try to get these in your heart a little bit in your mind. Number one. The sailors are about to take the lifeboat off of the ship and sneak away. The Apostle Paul notes it. That's the centurion, not one of the soldiers, the Apostle Paul. And he says to the centurion, Hey, unless these remain in the ship, you cannot be saved. If you don't have the sailors to sail the boat, we're going to not make it. Number one, if you want to survive your wreck, stay where you are. Remember say with me, number one is, stay where you are. Say that together, stay where you are. Number one is what? Stay where you are. There is a human tendency to run from trouble. We have difficulties at work, we'll just get another job. We have something happen in the church we don't like, we'll just go somewhere else. Our marriage is not what we call it. We'll just marry somebody else. There's a human tendency to run away. But my Bible says, continue thou in the things that thou hast learned. You can find some place to go that will stab your conscience slightly. Jeremiah talked about the progressive church. He said, you heal the wounds of the daughter of my people slightly. And we won't give you deep truth. We won't give you real answers. We'll just tell you everything's good and it's okay. And you can do all whatever you want and God's going to be fine with it. You can find some place like that. But if you want to survive your wreck, you never survive it by running away. Number one is stay where you are. When you say with me again, number one is what? Stay where you are. Archie Robinson's in heaven now. He's a big black guy. Played football for the Miami Dolphins. Was the second winningest basketball coach in Flint, Michigan's history. At his funeral, he had white guys and black guys that he didn't influence to go into coaching. One of them stood up there and listened to people speaking, and he said, he said, Coach Robinson, he was like a black Bobby Knight. So he was a Christian, and he didn't talk. Great, one of the best Christians ever, ever, to join the First Baptist Church of Bridgeville. MVP for Hillsdale College, All American. Had one daughter. She went off to college. And this didn't seem right. The house was empty. And Archie Robinson decided, I'm going to leave First Baptist Church of Bridgeville. We have a Tuesday night. What we call a summer preaching conference at our church about eight or nine, sometimes ten Tuesday nights that the preachers come in. We had the regular speaker for that Tuesday night couldn't come and had a friend of mine come from a couple hours away named Tom Harrison. And Tom Harrison talked about the children of Israel going through the wilderness and how if they hadn't been willing to travel that 40 years, they wouldn't ever made it into the promised land. And Archie Robinson said, that sermon changed my mind, I'm going to stay. He died, remember, first by the church of Bridgeport. He lived long enough to see his daughter come back from college and teach on our staff where she has been for 11 years. And October the 15th, just a little remote, we had the privilege of performing her wedding to a wonderful young man. But it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't stayed. 
to run away. Number one is, number two, we get further down in the passage. Skips run into a creek, the first front part of his stuck, the back part's broken off. And here's the command. Those who can swim should pass themselves into the water and swim. Huh? God's going to rescue me and now I've got to jump in the water. I thought God was going to do something miraculous and take care of me. I heard about a guy who was in a, an area where there had been terrible storms. The floods were rising and sitting in the front porch of water almost to the top of the porch. And a rowboat came by and said, Mister, this flooding's going to get worse. We're here to rescue people as you get in the boat. No, he said, I'm a Christian. God's going to take care of me. Water got higher. He's down the second story of his house, looking out the window. A speedboat comes by. Mister, climb out that window, get in this boat. We're here to rescue people like you. This flood's going to get worse. He said, No, I'm, I'm a child of God. God promised to always take care of me, never leave for a Water gets higher. He's down on the very peak of the roof, and the helicopter comes by. Drops down the ladder, and they shoot the them, grab the ladder. The water's getting worse. He said, No, no, I'm saved. God will take care of me. The helicopter blew off, and he drowned. That's heaven. He said, God, why didn't you take care of me? You said you'd never leave me for saying I was trusting you, and I drowned. And God said, I sent you a rowboat, a speedboat, and a helicopter. What more did you want? So here's number two when you get in a storm and you want to survive your wreck. Do what you can. Can you swim? Swim. Number one is stay where you are. Number two is. Do it again. You don't have to be preaching. You see this. You travel around and there's churches bemoaning their inability to reach their area with the gospel. And they're all upset because maybe they don't have this. Don't one doesn't have money. The other doesn't have population. There. One doesn't have any workers. Another doesn't have any buildings. And they thought, like, if I only had that, then we could do something for God. Well, I got a question. What can you do? Don't tell me what you can't do. What can you do? I wonder, I wonder if anybody can do this. You can't do that. Well, do what you can. Uh, uh, you got family troubles and you get paralyzed because of the issues. And so husbands stop being loving to their wives and wives stop submitting to their husbands and parents stop trying to love and raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and they let this other problem paralyze and get them all set. And God says, hey, he didn't swim, swim. Stop. Tell everybody all the things you don't have and start doing what you can do. And you can do something. You can pray. You can read your Bible. You can be faithful to church. You can listen to the sermons from the Word of God and apply them in your life. Husbands can love their wives and families can turn to God. And you can witness to that unsaved neighbor. And you can take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ at work. Do what you can. Number one was, number two was, number three. They're really stuck now, literally. Some part of the boat's stuck in the creek. That part's broken off. The swimmers have jumped off, and now the non swimmers are there. The Bible says some of them got bored. Really, God, a bored? This is your divine deliverance mechanism. A board. I find so much that I think I could probably make the announcements for the private events. There has been something like this. In the unlikely event of a water landing, a board has been provided for your safety. <laughs> right? You don't need water. You get a boat the Coast Guard says. You got so many boards on board. One board for every passenger. Oh, they don't. I said, a life jacket. These guys got a board. A board. So here's number three. Use what you have. Hey. I, the older I get, the more tools I want to have. I don't care if you use it once or twice. Having it when you need it, the right tool, is hugely important. And I now have a lot of tools. We live in a wooded, 
squat. We, I always get down here called Buckthorn. It's the nicest tree that grows up and shows out other trees. And I've been clearing a lot of land the last year and a half, two years or so. And, uh, and we got a nice pond there. And, and when I started out, all I had was a wheelbarrow and a McCullough chainsaw. A McCullough chainsaw is like maybe 5% better than a butter knife. That's all I had. Cut down much reason. Now, I've got a lot of chainsaws. Now, man, if my skill level requires at least two chainsaws. So when you get one stuck, you can cut it out with the other one. <laughs> But I did not fail to do what I could do when I was limited in my potential and limited in my equipment. I used what I had. You get a board, grab the board. Don't feel sorry of yourself. Don't complain if somebody else has a light jacket and you don't have a board. Use what you can. Amen. So number one was Number two was, number three was, here's what you have. Here's number four. The Bible says, and some on broken pieces of the ship. Wow. They didn't even get aboard. They got a broken piece. They grabbed it and the splinters poked into their fingers. They pulled it to themselves and it hurt. I can imagine them seeing some of them by the nice board and they got a broken piece. Oh, good for you. So I just wait. I always get the worst. The risk is a board, I get a broken piece. But you know, it says they all got safe to shore. Here's the last suggestion you're going to survive your wreck. Stay where you are, do what you can, use what you have. Take what you can. I wish everybody got a board. I wish every family had a husband and wife to help raise their children. That's the way God set it up. I wish nobody had to worry if they made to keep the power for another month. I wish nobody was in jeopardy of not being able to pay the mortgage. I'm wondering if they're going to lose the house. I wish everybody had good health and could get out of bed and on their own power navigate and do what they needed to do. I wish nobody had to barely drag themselves out of bed to the bathroom and every step was painful and difficult and it took them five times as long to do simple tasks as somebody else. I wish everybody got a board. But some got a broken piece. And the fact of the matter is that they all made it straight to shore. I'd like to sail without storm or gale on a smooth and placid sea. With a gentle breeze that my sails would seize and achieve my destiny, then no sudden squall on my ship would fall or make dark the midday sky, nor the thunder crash or the lightning flash till I reach my port on high. Never troubled seas or opposing breeze, just smooth sailing day by day. Not a storm to face or my smile erase as I journey on my way. Never blown off course by the tempest force. Not a bit of strain or strife, only light and peace. Never joy decreased as I still the sea of life. They listen to the hooky pooky television station. They'll say that's what you're supposed to have. You'll always have money. You'll always be helped. Your two lawns get all A's. Your car will never break down. Your tires will never go flat. And your dog won't have to leave. Especially if you spend them money. The Bible says man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. In the world you shall have tribulation. But the lightnings flash and the waves that crash interrupt my travels there. And my path I've lost as my ship is tossed and my life is filled with care. 
For the raging sea brings no peace to me, and the land seems far away. My poor ship will break and no headway make, and it's dark for many a day. Now all hope I've lost as my waves I'm tossed in the violent troubled sea. It's all done, I think, as I start to think. Then, broken teeth by me. Though I cannot swim and I'm tired of limb and a board is not my lot, I will seize the peace nor my grip release for you see it's all I've got. Yet not really all, for on him I call and upon his word rely that I'll make it over to that peaceful shore in my mansion by and by. So remember, friend, when things break and bend and your journey is really tough, though the storm won't cease, you've a broken peace. And with Jesus, that's enough.